Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. This is another art video and we are going to paint uh, this clock here. This is the Clarice clock in Dublin. It's quite uh, iconic, uh, sort of a landmark of the city. And it's very interesting in terms of perspective as well. The materials you will need is some paper. I'm using here a 15 by 10 piece of watercolor paper from Arches. A couple of pens with waterproof inks. I'm using this Fude Nib fountain pen, which is absolutely my favorite pen, filled with Noodler's bulletproof ink and as well some fine liners. Now I think this is from uh, Micrum Pigma and so on and so forth. You would of course need a pencil and uh, your favorite watercolor palette. Although you will see that we are going to use just a very limited palette. In terms of brushes, I'm using an Aramber 12 Raphael brush and this is a watercolor synthetic brush. So let's get started. I always like to tape down my paper so it doesn't uh, warp with the moisture of the watercolor paint, but this is completely up to you. I think that overall it gives a little nice touch to the painting, leaving a interesting white border all around. So if framing the painting you wouldn't require any mount or anything like that. Let's start drawing. The picture is going to be linked below in the description so you can download it, but I'm gonna put it here as well for your reference. The first thing that I'm doing is trying to center the clock within my page. And once again, this is a 15 by 10 um, piece of watercolor paper. And as you can see, I am taking into account a little bit of the perspective of the clock and I am positioning my main subject on the left side of the page, just so very slightly slanted. Now, the important thing here is to understand the perspective. It's a weird shape, it's not a cube, and uh, it's seen from downwards, on the left side, so there is a bit of perspective. It took me a very long time to understand the shape of this clock, but my main focus is now to create a sort of 3D picture of the entire piece as if it was empty. And to do so, I draw the main part of the clock, what I see, and then I connect all those lines that are behind. This will help me to understand what are the center pieces and where to fit everything else. Now I'm going to focus on that little decoration piece on the bottom of the clock, the little cone shape thing, and to do so I need to find the exact center of my clock. And to do so, to find the center, I trace the corners of uh, my cube shapey type of thing of the clock. For the further top to the nearest left bottom, and for the further top uh, left side to the nearest bottom right side. Does it make any sense? To do so, then I cross a line uh, perpendicular underneath from the center and I magically find the center of my clock. Uh, the next piece is actually to draw that conical shape and I just um, unite, uh, connect the angle to that center point that we just found. 
and uh, magically the coney decoration shape appears and then it's just a matter of uh, drawing the concave part and the bulging part so that it resembles what we have now uh, this is uh, the video is uh, live speed so you can get an idea of uh, all the trouble that I went through in trying to figure out the perspective and uh, finding the center point and drawing all the details but it's not impossible I use this technique of uh, joining the centers, the corners, to find the center when I draw, for example, arches or inside of uh, uh, churches with a beautiful um, navet, I think they are called, and uh, the ceilings. But let's get back into the painting, the drawing, rather. I am working now on the top. And once again, as a general rule, I do like to focus on the main, the bigger shapes first and last uh, I leave the details. So on the top we have this little archy type of thing and it's a replicated in the two sides that I'm seeing. Now, I know that we are talking about perspective, but it is so small that sometimes perspective is quite difficult to recreate in such a small place. So it's just a matter of frogging and make the piece more believable. On the left side you see we have one of the faces of the clock and this is a kind of a roundy shape. Now, round-wise, I figure out that when I'm drawing a circle in perspective, it's always a circle. So sometimes you do like a little arch to represent the circle, but that uh, is kind of um, mimicking the circle. It's not a real circle. So every time I draw a circle, I think about a circle and I draw it. So this to say that you need to be very um, true to life. Don't draw a little arch. And this is true, for example, if you're drawing a, um, the water inside of a glass, you just draw the little arch of the water, but it is a circle. So always think about the circle. I am uh, just putting down some lines for the clock, nothing too precise. Uh, the details, once again, will come later. I just want to get more and more of an idea where everything really goes.
So I'm almost done with uh, drawing and it's time for inking. I know it's not 100% precise, but I think it gives a very good idea of what I'm trying to represent. And as well, the prospective rules are followed quite well. Now it's time of uh, inking and I'm using a batch of uh, fine liners and uh, waterproof inks uh, situation. Uh, the thing that I like the most is using, of course, my fountain pen, my Fudenib fountain pen. But uh, if you don't happen to have one, uh, a series of uh, this Unipin or any other waterproof ink uh, fine liner works well. I like first to go in with uh, a finer fine liner. Sorry for the game awards here. This is a 0 0.2 and I work the other way around rather than drawing. I do the details first and then with a bolder nib pen I will trace the actual main shapes. I think this is part of um, sort of my style of drawing and uh, as well it works really really well with uh, the coloring part of the watercolor so I think the colors pop a little bit more when you get this bold wide um, lines of uh, detailing. Now the details here are quite minute so I'm just going to work on the details that I actually can see or that are facing uh, the face of the clock that is towards me and I am just suggesting what's behind then of course your mind will do the rest and will put everything together especially if you know the place that you're drawing or the clock we are just suggesting things rather than making a photograph a picture for that we have our phone and so on so I wouldn't be too worried about that. This is as well the time in which you will work uh, with your style, your particular style, do what you enjoy. In my case, of course, I do like to be quite precise in my drawing and uh, this is not really common in the watercolor urban sketching community. I have seen that people tend to be really loose with their sketch and I have desperately tried to be loose as well. I really uh, enjoy the magic that uh, a very loose uh, urban sketch can bring you and as well I am enjoying very much to bring my watercolor pad around with me and sketch quickly on the go. But um, in years and years of practice, I understood that it's probably not my cup of tea or not happening. I'm probably not that talented, but here you go. I made it a sort of a feature. After erasing the majority of my pencil mark, I go in with my Fuda pen. 
Fude um, is, I think, the Japanese word for brush. Uh, the nib of the fountain pen is bent, so you can get wider and thinner strokes, uh, signs, um, lines, as you bend your hand while you're drawing. With my food nib pen, I just like to kind of highlight the profile of the picture without going into too many details. I do like to work on the outside lines and as well some of the main inside lines where, for example, a big angle is or uh, the top of an arch or where a shadow goes. Like here, for example, I am outlining the, one of the main shapes of this clock. And I think it works very, very well. The ink that I'm using is uh, waterproof. This is quite essential if you are working with uh, watercolor. If you decide to leave the drawing like this, like a, a drawing, that is absolutely not necessary. I have a few brands that I may recommend you. I don't know if uh, everywhere Noodlers is available. Certainly here in Ireland it was very very difficult to get and I got a little tiny bottle in a trip to the US a few years ago. So it's uh, extraordinarily um, easy to find other very well known and very good brands. Now it's time for the coloring part. I just added, by the way, a teeny tiny bit of uh, masking fluid or drawing gum where the letters of the uh, clock are going and uh, on the numbers of the clock. But that is 100% uh, uh, really your call. Um, I generally don't like working with masking fluid, it's very messy and I never managed to get it right. But if you prefer, um, it's completely up to you. Color-wise, I'm using a cerulean blue, and it's very, very diluted. Once, uh, because the cerulean blue that I own is only a student grade uh, cerulean blue, so it's not really pigmented. I should probably invest in um, an artistic quality, an artist quality or professional, tube of cerulean blue but uh, it's extraordinarily expensive by far the most expensive color that i have in my palette so because i use it all the time i just can't afford it and uh, i am uh, buying a student grade but that's um nothing um to say <laughs> anyway i am just going to uh, highlight uh, the um, background um, kind of a sky type of thing with some splashes of this lovely cerulean blue uh, i do like to leave part of the background uh, in plain paper in my drawing generally so you would never see me working the entire background as a flat wash Getting now into the actual clock phase, I'm using a combination of burnt amber and uh, sap green with just the tiniest bit of Prussian blue. This creates, in my opinion, a gorgeous, gorgeous brown that it's very well suited for something like shadows and uh, dark spots. It's very natural. And you can easily make it into a more vibrant, uh, warmer brown or adding a tiny more of a Prussian blue, it can easily become a very, very cold grey. I am being very generous with my water and this is because the paper can hold a ton of water. It really acts like a sponge and uh, I really enjoy working and working over and over my layers of paint so to create the actual color that I desire or that I see. You can notice now 
especially on the bottom of this painting, how I added a bit more Prussian blue and uh, sap green to create a lighter tone, but at the same time much colder. Of course, you have to think the light of the sun is a usually a warm light and it comes from above generally. Well, all the time comes from above, right? So everything that is underneath must be a little bit colder. And this is kind of a rule of thumb that I think I read somewhere or someone told me. Anyway, I am going to add quite of a plain layer, really, really wet. This paper especially allows you to lift the colors quite easily so that you can just add your highlights later rather than be super careful at this stage of uh, painting your shadows and your highlights. You can see now I am just taking off the amount of paint that I don't need because I need an highlight. And I'm going back with uh, my shadowy part uh, as well. This paper stays wet for the longest amount of time. So even if you add color later on, after you removed, you never are going to see a very defined edge on your painting. Everything gets smooth. Look at that, how it blends beautifully together. For the faces of the clock, uh, we have the exact same mixture. In this case, though, the majority of the color is a sap green and Prussian blue. And this creates a nice, interesting, kind of natural looking green that I use generally for woodlands or trees. But in this case, it suits very well this clock. I am painting on the top of my numbers and times uh, just because I use masking fluid, <laughs> but if you are not using the masking fluid, feel free to um, draw all the details at this stage. Of course, another technique would be to draw them with uh, some white gouache or some white gel pen afterwards. Now, because the surface of this clock is uh, around and is dome shape, I need to be quite careful where I place uh, the lights and the shadows, where the clock reflects it. If you see on your reference photo, we have all the informations there. So just analyze your picture and it will give you all the answers.
Now I let the drawing, the painting completely uh, dry and as you can see the colors are so much lighter. I as well removed my masking fluid completely being very very careful not to smudge the ink or the watercolor. And with some yellow ochre I am just going to fill in the white spaces where all the yellowish details are. This is a very fiddly process and I'm not going to hide I don't enjoy it one minute. Also yellow ochre is not my favorite color but among the yellows I think is the uh, more versatile. So I really recommend it if you are painting something uh, natural looking like uh, some landscape uh, or some foliage. Uh, use yellow ochre rather than any other yellows it will work much much better for the yellow part as well i'm leaving some white spaces where more or less i think the light will go because it's yellow because it's gold in real life it reflects the light a lot so this helps us to recreate that sort of effect The last touch will be to kind of reinforce a little bit those shadows and those lights. And so I am going to work with my mixture of Prussian blue and uh, burnt amber and uh, sap green just to get that tiny bit of a humph on my shadows or my darker parts. I think the last step makes everything pop so so much better and that's basically it uh, for a very simple but quite intricate clock these techniques can be used almost for every kind of street furniture um, urban sketching uh, type of scenario and if you did use my technique or recreate the Clary's clock Please tag me along on my Instagram account. My handle is Irish Farm Art, or you can find me on Facebook or my website. All the links are below in the description as well. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.